There we go. Says we're recording. Okay, good. Hey, everybody. Um, it's about five after, so we're going to start up. It is. I got us going. Good. Guys, thanks for joining us. Um, Kim and I are going to, well, actually, mostly Kim's going to talk to you tonight with you and answer questions. Um, it's the fourth in a series of some meetups that I've uh, put together for a lot of my Agile friends in the Metro Detroit area. Um, free one, so we're all working at home. I want to keep you guys occupied with some fun things after work. Um, I'm Rob Kelman. I think almost all of you on the call know me um, in the Zoom meeting. Some might not. I own Michigan Technology Services out in Farmington Hills. Um, for those of you who are out of state, Farmington Hills is right outside of Detroit. We're a suburb. Um, and we offer everything agile that you can think of. Um, lots of workshops and uh, a lot of coaching as well. As I said before, just a little word, I'm recording this and because some people, I had a couple of people email me saying they couldn't make it and I will post a copy of the video to um, probably YouTube and I'll let you guys know via a, an email where it's going to be at. Uh, Kim, I'm going to let you, you know, give a little background on yourself. You might have it in your slides, but so you guys know, Kim and I are, are collaborating and we're going to do a Scrum at Scale workshop this coming August. She is not just a Scrum at Scale educator, she actually trains people to become Scrum at Scale educators. So she knows the material quite a well, quite well. Um, and she knows the Scrum master and the product on the roles and all that good stuff and the agile leadership. Um, she actually ran transformation for a very large uh, global company, which I'm not gonna say, she can say she wants to, for a number of years before she went coaching for uh, a couple other large companies. Um, so the game plan, I'll let me do a presentation for you know, 30, 40 minutes, we'll see how it's going. And then some time for questions and answers. And if people have to go, you can go, then we'll come back if we have a smaller breakout, if people that wanna ask some more detailed questions. Um, and we'll talk, you know, I've got future meetups. It's you know, at michiganagiletraining.com. You can always just learn about things there if you want to. Kim, it's uh, for you. Okay, great. So I am going to share my screen. I'm sure that's on your bingo card. Um, <laughs> and then let me pull your faces back up. There we go, okay. Um, so as Rob said, my name is Kim Antello and um, I do do a lot of training, a lot of coaching. I did work in a large global manufacturing organization and exactly uh, Facebook told me yesterday that four years ago today, I was in Detroit and in Romulus. So uh, just a fun and interesting fact that that happened exactly four years ago. Um, shortly after that, I left that large manufacturing organization and went to work for Jeff Sutherland at Scrum Inc. And so you'll see some of the things on my profile here that are more based in some of the things that he supports. Um, I have recently left Scrum Inc. and am now leading my own organization, which is Antello Agility. Um, I focus mostly on executives and leadership. So Scrum at Scale really comes into play very well for this um, because we're really focusing on how do we change the overall organization and not just um, the, the teams. I did start off as a developer in the 90s. Um, it, you might see my son walk behind me at some point. He is home from college. Um, so uh, that, that's a fun thing that we're dealing with at this point in time with kids coming back from college or getting kicked out because of the COVID. Um, I've also spent a lot of my history working in highly regulated organizations in healthcare, aviation, and um, retail credit as well. And I've also been able to do some really fun stuff at hospitals in the operating room. Um, I'm a Scrum at Scale trainer and I, I mentor those trainers. I'm an LST uh, fellow, so I can train trainers to become uh, trainers of the licensed Scrum program. I recently joined the Agile Leadership Journey, focusing on that as well as the Path to Agility Facilitator. So lots of things and transformation that I am focused on and that's about it on me. So let's get going. Okay. So the first thing that we wanna really talk about is servant leadership. And if we want to be successful in these agile transformations, we really need to focus on servant leadership. 
And the reason for that is that we need to make sure that we're not just saying, hey, I'm the leader of the organization and you need to do what, what I need you to do. But we really need to step back and focus on what is it that's actually needed and what can we do to help others within the organization so that we can really rely on um, being able to, to do what's best for the organization and what's best for our customers. So the question is, what are the organization's problems? They start to go through um, transformations or they say that they need to go into an agile or digital transformations. Why, why is it that they're trying to do that? And just so that you know, I am going to ask you all kinds of questions. So be ready to unmute your uh, microphone. You can hit the command space bar or the control space bar. I don't know how to use a PC. So can anyone tell me why, why is it that companies are typically trying to figure out this whole agile stuff and why are they going about doing it? Anyone? To um, deliver solutions faster. Faster solutions. Anything else? There's that then <laughs> one that I see frequently is it's the current buzzword. So we, we must have to be able to, to uh, implement this. It's in the Harvard Business Review. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm an important person and I need to make sure that my organization is doing that. Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, other people are doing it. It's the buzzword. Let's do it. Um, any other things? Reducing cost. Yeah, reducing costs. Um, so just a couple of things that we've put on here. So producing more, delivering faster, the, the culture of work, like how are we actually working together? Um, so then the question is, what should organizations do to go about doing it? Now, I'm assuming that the majority of you know a little bit something about Agile, so uh, we'll probably go through this a little bit quickly. But the traditional management approaches say, hey, I need my people to work harder, and they need to work faster, or maybe they need to work longer hours. Or, hey, maybe I'll go and hire a bunch of additional teams. And we see that that doesn't work. Um, we also see that they ask people to specialize and to create silos of their specific skill um, so that they can do that one task very, very well. Um, but we know that that doesn't <laughs> necessarily work. Um, and that was the way that we used to manage things back in Taylorism and then um, in the lean production system. But now we have lots of different issues that we're dealing with and we have a huge amount of change that we're going through. So people have been... Uh, historically focused on, on um, getting individuals to increase their personal productivity. Um, but we need to figure out a solution that we can actually increase the productivity across the entire organization. Um, but the solution has to be easy to understand, proven and effective, easy to replicate across all of the teams that we're doing, and we also have to be able to have measurable results. So we need those four things in order for us to really be able to replicate this throughout organizations. So hopefully we'll, we'll talk about what some of that looks like. So Scrum, as hopefully many of you know, has a, has a pretty good track record. Now there are definitely some stories where people have implemented Scrum in some events and not actually embodied the uh, values and have been disasters. Um, it's pretty easy to understand and replicate and there's all kinds of trainers and coaches, including myself, <laughs> who <laughs> could help you out. Um, so it has a, a, a lightweight solution that um, can help you. Now Scrum at scale just takes Scrum and then scales it through the organization. Again, simple and easy to understand. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about efficiency. So I would send you into breakout rooms, but there aren't too many of you on here. So let's have a conversation um, about efficiency. So what does efficiency mean to you? I would say um, reduction of rework for sure. Uh, okay. So reduction of rework, any other ideas? Doing the, task with the, doing the task with the fewest number of steps. Doing a task with the fewest number of steps, okay. Delivering quality product with... Um, okay. Um, so if you reflect on the people that you work with and you, and you reflect on your daily work, is that pretty consistent with how you work or are you constantly reworking things? Are there lots of steps? Are there lots of handoffs? Uh, 
Oh, there's lots of steps. How about two pre-meetings before you can go into the first of the change review meetings? Okay, so we have to have meetings to, to get ready for the meetings and we've got to prep people to say, hey, I'm going to say this. Is that going to be okay? Or am I going to be rocking the boat a little too much? Okay, yeah, I, I've, I've definitely seen that more than a few times. Um, I think also, too, I think sometimes we, we have tools um, and every organization has some guilt in this as well I, where I've been at. You can have tools that actually complicate the process. And, oh, yeah. No, and then bottleneck the, the throughput that's needed. So I, I love it when people say, oh, well, we implemented Rally or we implemented JIRA. Therefore, we're, we're agile. We, we've got that. We, we've done that. Um, yes, yeah, so definitely. Sometimes the tools can actually complicate things. Um, so let's talk about some red flags that we might see. So um, in t with teamwork specifically, um, some red, red flags that we might identify are we've got a really full backlog. Um, I was at an organization a, a, probably two years ago, and they said, oh, well, we don't have that much in our backlog. We have like 250,000 items in our backlog. And I was just like, okay, let's just delete that and let's start fresh. What are we actually going to do? Um, or people are busy. Um, I've been in a number of organizations where they've said, hey, we have a meeting culture. And I think, Linda, you were talking about the meeting before the meeting before the meeting. So if you're going to be scheduled to be in meetings for so many hours a day, it's hard for you to actually become more efficient. Or how about this one? Um, low product pride. Is everyone willing to go out there and say, hey, I work on this product? Or are they like, oh, well, I do some things and they kind of do these things, um, but they're not really proud of the product that we work on. Um, and then the last one, that the team doesn't really feel like a team but they feel like a group of individuals. So maybe if they're doing daily standups or daily scrums, they're standing around and saying what they did, but they don't really need to listen to anyone else because they're not really working with anyone else. So these are some red flags that we might focus on um, as we look at efficiency. Um, so there are two different kinds of efficiency. So personal efficiency, what can I do to get more efficient? But then also, what does process efficiency look like? And so what does that look like from the bigger uh, goal or the bigger organization? So I'm going to walk you through a, a quick example. And this has absolutely nothing to do with software. So there was a case study, and there's a link, um, and I'll get you the, the slides, or Rob will somehow get you the slides. Um, but there's a study in Sweden, and they found that to take um, a patient and get them diagnosed with ADHD, that it was taking all of these steps. So there was the patient or the parents interview, the, the chat with the kid, the functional investigation, the psychological investigation, a medical investigation, concluding, and then final diagnostics. So seven different steps. Sounds pretty easy. The problem is that this whole process was taking four months. Could you imagine being a parent of a child who was struggling with schoolwork and it was suspected that they had ADHD um, and they're still struggling with work, they're still struggling with conversations, uh, the parents are reaching out to the you know, physician's offices trying to figure out what's going on. And so this particular group, they got together and they said, hey, <laughs> we're doing these seven steps, but there's so much time. There's so much waiting time between all of this. And they mapped it out and they said, hey, this is taking four months and this is really too long. And even though there were different people that were working on each of these steps, they were able to figure out how could they shrink those steps and come together in a much quicker and more efficient process. So they actually changed that step um, so that they were, instead of working on lots of different patients at the same time, they started to only work on five patients at a time. So in this case, you can see um, Nima has gone through all seven of those steps and he did it in those three weeks. Jenny is partial, partially through. Now our, our, our patient, Emil, um, he's only partially, partially through Fanny and then Emma. So very quickly, now this practice could uh, see where, what's the status of all of these various different things and how does that work across the organization? So here you can see that instead of it taking four months, they were able to improve that process to three weeks. So let's take a look at the rest of the results. <clears throat> Oops, let's go. Um, so five times faster, good and stable, high quality, um, great customer experience. Could you imagine being the parent of this and, and 
maybe having one child go through the old process and then having a child go through the other process and really being able to see the improvement in this. Uh, reduce stress from the employees who are getting bombarded by our customers trying to figure out where, where is my child through this whole process. Um, increased employee satisfaction because they know that they're actually getting better and um, significantly improved productivity. So the question that we would ask for this is, is how is this possible? And um, what does the customer experience look like? So we might ask some questions like to our customers. Um, well, for our teams, we might ask them, you know, how often are you actually talking to your customers? Do they know what the process looks like? Um, do they understand when they're gonna get new features or new things? Um, who do they have to deal with? This is my favorite one. How many different people or teams do they have to deal with? And what's the waiting time between those different teams? Um, it, when I was actually going to visit Detroit on a pretty regular basis, one of the programs that I was on, we were building a um, website to make sure that airplanes stayed in the sky. So the kind of important thing. And our customers, they would say, I don't care how you're organized at your company but your tool doesn't make any sense for us and how we have to actually use it. So we had to figure out how do we get those product owners to come together as they're in different places within the organization to really be able to focus on what are the customer's needs and how do we specifically address those. Um, so when we're looking at some of these problems that we have, the first thing that we might wanna do is to focus on um, oh, there we go. On how can we improve that customer experience and how do we get the things to work um, together better? How do we shed light on, on the overall process? Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is to take a look back and say, what is it that we're actually building? How do we actually build it? And how can we make um, a commitment to, to getting better? Um, so I'll ask you in your groups and your teams, um, what does this look like? Do, do you have any of these problems in your organization? And if you had a problem like this, how would you go about addressing some of these issues? Anyone? So if you are slow to get things out to your customers, if you don't know what the process is of your customers, or you, you've got some ideas on how you would actually address those issues, what would you do? If you had an idea, what would you do? Anyone? Well, um, I, I, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 please. <laughs> well, um, Sometimes it's nice to have like a business case, a proposal mm -hmm. you may, uh, just to show that you went through some vetting on your own to show how this would be um, the best solution or a remedy to whatever you're trying to resolve in the organization or the process. Okay, yeah, absolutely, Jessica. Um, so if you had a business case, then who would you take it to? Well, it depends on my audience. So if it's my team lead, it's something within the team itself, the nucleus there, mm -hmm. it would be my team lead. Or if it's somebody who, um, if I'm thinking of how we can save on our, you know, our ROI, our return on investments, mm -hmm. um, there's something that I see from my RD standpoint, then more likely it would be those who are overseeing um, the the organizational um, milestones and projects and things like that. So it, it just depends on, what is the business case for? What is the solution? What are we trying to solve? Okay, great. Absolutely. Connie, is there anything else that you wanted to add? I hate to admit this, but uh, somebody from work pinged me because I made the mistake of signing on with my work PC. <clears throat> so I didn't get to hear what the uh, comment was. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, that's fine. So let's talk about this and I'll expand on what Jessica was talking about. So I would typically uh, recommend this sample and te impediment template that, as Jessica said, the first thing is being able to articulate what is the actual business impact. Um, so first we're going to say, what is the impediment? Um, what is the impact of that impediment? Um, what have we already done to try to remove that impediment? 
And then as the team, uh, the fourth thing being, what do we think that we would recommend to leaders to see if they would take our recommendation and move forward with it? Um, so this is a sample that I've used in a number of organizations when we're starting to have that conversation with leaders and we're starting to create that servant leadership and that empowerment um, so that leaders can start to understand what it is that the problem is. And as Jessica was saying, we wanna put this into speak that the leaders are able to absorb and understand. Um, so what is the impediment making it very clear what it is that we're trying to address? And then the impact. Is there an ROI, a return on investment? Is there something that's preventing us from getting things out to our customers? Um, <clears throat> and then making sure that we're articulating what have we already done to try to address this issue um, shows that leaders shows to leaders that we're not just saying, hey, I'm a, a whiny little kid, um, but we've actually tried to do something to resolve this. And then the last thing on resolving this, what is our recommendation to resolve it? If you keep going to leaders with these impediments with a recommendation and they say, sounds like a great idea, sounds like a great idea. Yes, that's a proof. Go ahead, go ahead. Then we start to see the delegation power um, increase. Um, so this is just a sample, not anything that's required by Scrum at Scale, um, but just something that we found through coaching in many organizations to help us with starting that conversation. So I've opened you up with all sorts of things about efficiency and trying to figure out what problems are and how do we make things faster. And, and that's all like common sense. We learned about all of those things, even in our business analyst class before we were doing um, Scrum, right? Um, but let's talk about how this applies to Scrum and Scrum at Scale specifically. So um, just quickly, the roots of Scrum at Scale. This guy, his name is Jeff Sutherland, Dr. Jeff Sutherland. He's done all sorts of things in his life. Um, he was a West Point graduate. He was a fighter um, pilot in Vietnam. He was in the Air Force Academy. He went to medical school and did a lot of cancer research. And then he went to uh, be the CIO or CTO of 11 different companies before he decided to create Scrum Inc., which is the company that he founded. Um, through this, he actually started to use Scrum at scale um, <laughs> even before he says that he, he started to use Scrum, which was in 1993. So all of this stuff is really based off of his background and um, his experience. Um, so Scrum at Scale is a lightweight framework and um, it's really focused on growth. And there's only a couple of things that we're trying to get through here. There are two cycles and we'll go through those quickly. There's a triad of the three things that we need to start. There are two um, key events that we're trying to scale and then three roles. Um, but overall, the picture is very simple because we're only trying to add things um, as they're needed. We're not giving you this really big, really complicated picture uh, that you need to go and implement. So let's start with this. This is the overall Scrum at Scale diagram. It's just this. Now, there, there's some interesting things about this diagram. Um, on the left-hand side, we have the Scrum Master Cycle, which is the how. And then on the right-hand side, we have the Product Owner Cycle, which is the what. And those come together and overlap with things where there's some overlap between the Product Owner Cycle and the Scrum Master Cycle, um, specifically focused on the team. But it's not top-down. It's cyclical in nature. We're getting feedback. We're looking at, hey, I'm, I've got a vision that I'm setting all the way up at the top on this um, right-hand side here with the strategic vision. And then that goes down to how am I actually getting product out to our customers? And what is the feedback that I'm getting from our, our customers? What are the metrics and transparency? And then on the Scrum Master Cycle here, we're, we're looking at how are we constantly getting better? How are we continuously improving? How are we opening those lines of communication to tell our leaders, hey, this process sucks and we've got a better idea on how to, how to accomplish it um, and meet the goal or objective of that particular thing. They're also focused on how do we do cross-team coordination? So how do we work across multiple teams that need to work together? And how do we actually get stuff out to our customers? Whether it's software solutions, or a year ago, I was in an OR room helping them turn around operating rooms. I just had ACL surgery, so that's very relevant to me at this point in time. So this is all that's really in the Scrum at Scale diagram. And it's really just the core things that come from, um, from Scrum on the product owner side, as well as on the, um, the Scrum master side. 
Now there are two sets of words in here that you may not have ever seen if you've just gone through scrum training. And that's the executive meta scrum and the executive action team. And we'll get into those in just a little bit. Any questions on this before I move forward? Is this slightly less complicated than other diagrams you may have seen? Okay. It is. I, I think I've actually seen that uh, diagram before. Okay. Not really, I can't remember where I've seen it. Um, yeah, oh. I'll just leave it at that. Cool. Good. So that's really it for Scrum at Scale. Okay. <clears throat> Um, there is a triad. The heart of Scrum at Scale are these three things. So the team process. We need to ensure that the team is able to do good Scrum. And the problem is that many teams um, are prevented from doing Scrum, good Scrum because of their leadership and because of different policies, procedures, structures that are within the organization. Amen. Also, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> and then we have the executive meta Scrum that's focused on the product owner cycle. So what is it that we're actually building and why? And then the executive action team, which is helping us to get better at the how and how we're actually building that. So um, <clears throat> the first of all, the team process. There are five requirements that go into this. And many people talk about the, the three roles, the five events, the, um, and <coughs> excuse me, uh, and the artifacts. Um, but oftentimes people forget that Scrum also has these five values that are really important. And so when we talk about openness, respect, and courage, and how do those build on each other so that if I have an idea, I have the ability to escalate that um, to my team as well as to leaders. Uh, and then focus and commitment. If I don't have the ability to focus on the work that I'm doing and people are constantly throwing things at me, I don't have the ability to really commit to getting those things done. And then psychological safety. Do the people on the team have the ability to speak openly and freely, uh, you know, with respect, of course, um, about their ideas? Are we able to bring up new and crazy ideas at times? Um, are we able to bring those up to our leaders or are we worried about having to fall in line with what our leaders are asking us for? So these are some things that people often overlook when they're talking about Scrum. And so at Scrum at Scale, we're specifically saying, we need you to do good Scrum, which includes these things, the five values, uh, the empirical process of transparency, inspection, and adaption, and then um, the psych psychological safety. Any questions on that? Any other amens? Lots of amens. <laughs> Lots of amens, okay. So you all should know about those things. Now we're gonna talk about the two new, new guys that are on here. <clears throat> so the executive action team. This is a team that we pull together and we say, hey leaders, we want you to really be servant leaders to the organization. We want you to allow the organization to become more agile. And we wanna make sure that you're communicating, that you're um, helping, the, helping the teams do good scrum, not beating them up to have them do good scrum, but that you're observing metrics, not to beat people up, but to see where can you actually go and help people. We want you to go out and actively figure out what are those impediments and make sure that teams are raising those impediments and that you're uh, removing them, that you're focusing on process improvement and removing waste. And then what are the things that you're doing to help with an overall transformation backlog? Are you training people? Are you coaching people? Um, are you making sure that you've got communities of practices or guilds or a continuous learning um, processes in place? So this is definitely um, a, a new group, but we would typically ask that this team work together as a scrum team. They might do daily scrums. Um, and that's very much so in alignment, even with um, some business leaders like Patrick Lencioni. And he talks about some very similar things in his book, The Advantage. So even doing a daily scrum at the highest level of the organization so that they can constantly remove those impediments and, and focus on moving the organization forward. What would your leaders say if you asked them about this? What would they, they would, say if you, oh, go ahead. They would say it was a good idea and they would do it for like two weeks and then stop doing it. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, the feedback I've gotten is that that Scrum is is a, an, an IT um, mechanism to um, uh, what is the word that they use to sandbag the fact that it's been a long time to do work. <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's interesting because even Patrick Lencioni in, in that book, The Advantage, he talks about like at first people are, are really pushing back on being able to do this and then they find their flow and they start to work together as leaders. The interesting thing is that we find that so many leaders grew up through this process of being the superhero and having to be the one to shine and growing their fiefdoms and they haven't really been focused on becoming a team and working together for the betterment of the overall organization. Um, so if you can get someone to help them along this journey and to understand that they're people too, and they're going through this and that they've been working for 20, 30, 40, 50 years in leadership and have been incentivized to do one thing. And now we're asking them to do something else. Um, <clears throat> that's uh, something that comes to be quite, Im quite important as you're helping them through those conversations. Um, so then the next group is the executive meta scrum. And if we remember, they were on the right side of that diagram. And so they're really focused on the things that a product owner would be focused on. So they're focused on the, the big what of the organization and why of the organization. So they're providing visibility to the backlog, the overall organization backlog. I was at a financial institution um, about two years ago and everyone in the org that we talked to said, well, everything's number one. And when we went to the PMO and said, okay, <laughs> we're told that these 25 things are, are, are the top priority, they're number one. What is actually number one? So that if this team had a request from this project and this project, would they have any idea? And the answer was no. No one had ever had a conversation to talk about of all of the things that they had signed up to do in that year what were the actual most important things for them to get done. So we're asking leaders to say, what is the number one most important thing? And then how do you share that with your organization so that they can understand what those priorities are? And then how do we get those leaders in the product space to talk to each other about their products so that they can understand and anticipate dependencies more? And what are the metrics so that they know not only is it that, hey, are the teams performing, but that we're really focused on, are the customers buying? Are we building the right things? How do we know that we're building the right things? And are we celebrating when we're uh, shutting people down? Sorry about this. I have a little itch in my throat. So how many of you have organizations where you actually can see the backlog for the overall organization? If you were to go to some, to, if a team were to have multiple requests from different people, how would they know what's the most important thing to work on? Or do we just work on SLAs? Service level agreements. We have a backlog, but it looks pretty much like you described it where everything is getting, you know, it's a shotgun approach. Okay. And how successful are you on an annual basis of getting all of those things done on time? Um, not very. Not very, right. But what would you think the people who are working on those things would be able to see, or how would they feel? What would think, how would things change if they were actually able to see that list and know what's important so that when they got interrupted by someone who's number one or number two on the list, uh, would they actually work on it? How would that change your workspace? Sorry, I was struggling with the button. Um, uh, I think people would be extremely happy to understand how, A, how what they were working on fit in with the whole organization and B, how to, how to make good choices and when to say that that, you know, maybe be able to voice the fact that they were struggling with the choice. Yeah, absolutely. Providing that clarity, making it very, very aware, very transparent. These are the priorities of the organization. This is what is important for us to work on. And then empowering people to be able to make those decisions as opposed to having to go and say, hey, I have dependencies or, or I, I've got some conflicts. Which of these things do I actually work on? <clears throat> so uh, again, one of the top things that we focus on specifically with Scrum at Scale. 
So with Scrum at Scale, we're focused on how do we start small? How do we pick just a couple of teams? How do we get the organization to start to understand what does good Scrum look like? How do we focus on process efficiency for that team? How do we start to raise impediments to the organization? How do leaders start to respond to those impediments? How do those leaders start to work together as a team and actually make changes to some of the broader policies or structures that they have in place within their organization <clears throat> so that they can go, move forward? Um, some things to focus on are becoming highly efficient, removing waste in the process, and just making sure that um, <clears throat> we're moving forward, allowing for free flow of information. So I'll just show you a couple of examples of some groups who have implemented uh, Scrum at scale. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's an example of 3M, HIS. So um, that's still, yeah, they're still in the Midwest, Minnesota. Um, so in this case, this was just on their, HI, their health information systems group. And you could see here that they had uh, lots of different teams. So they had um, teams of teams that were working together. So here, each one of these little uh, pentagons is a team. And they had a team of teams that were working together. And they would have a chief product owner and a, a chief scrum master who was really focused on helping them to um, kind of grow in their organization. Um, and then that just continues to scale. If there were more than five teams, like in this case, there are 25 teams, and this is just very symmetrical, which doesn't really happen in real life, um, then you can see that that scales all the way up until the point to, the, to when they get to the actual leader of the overall organization. And so they had an executive meta scrum and the executive action team, but they also pulled in people from legal and um, <clears throat> compliance, and that's because they're working in the health space, so they needed to make sure that they were abiding by rules. Um, and they also had uh, customer relations, so people who were directly working with our customers, and they included people ops or HR to make sure that they were included in this overall conversation and could work with them. Um, there are some more complicated things over here on how do you deal with physicians who are not easy to put on every single team because they're kind of an expensive uh, uh, asset or resource. Um, let me just quickly go through there are three uh, roles that we are specifically uh, going to talk about. Um, and this is the product owner is gonna be a chief product owner. And that's the same thing, except um, over a larger group of teams. Scrum of scrums, you've just seen an example of that. Um, when we talk about scrum of scrums in scrum at scale, we're not talking about that daily standup, but we're talking about the team of teams and how those team of teams are working together uh, to deliver a specific product. And we only do that when they actually need to come together and work together. And then um, another role is a scrum of scrums master, which is <clears throat> basically helping all of the scrum masters come together and remove those impediments and work on how can we improve um, the scrum within our, our larger organization. And we can get into some deeper topics. Um, I just want to finish off before we get to questions um, with, one thing, <clears throat> as we go through our classes, um, we'll typically do a heat map that looks like this. So we will have each of the 12 nodes that you saw on this diagram, they'll, they'll be down here on the side and then we have each of the participants across the top. And we'll ask them to actually go through each of the 12 nodes as we talk about them and to rate where they are as an organization and what is the importance of that particular um, attribute of Scrum at Scale. And it's interesting because as you start to go through this, people are, are maybe a little bit afraid to put some red things up to say, hey, we really suck at this. But it's, uh, it's good to have other people putting their things up and having a psychologically safe environment because then you can start to see, hey, we're not the only ones that are dealing with this problem. And then you can look and you can see, hey, I've got a green, a green person over here. So can I go and talk to them and maybe get some pointers or some tips on what they've done to um, get their process better? At the end of the class, we'll take your whole column, so all of the nodes that are associated with um, your, your particular situation, and then we help you work on an actual roadmap. Because we wanna focus on not just giving you a recipe of here are the things that you need to do, but it really depends on your specific context. <clears throat> So um, if you need to focus on prioritizing your backlog or if you need to focus on um, creating a vision or um, continuously improving, 
we can look at those things and then say, what are the, the items that we're gonna work on to actually make an impact in your particular area? Um, so you come out of the Scrum at Scale classes specifically with a backlog, um, items that you could do for each one of those 12 nodes, and then um, we actually go through and prioritize them with you uh, during the class. So that's Scrum at Scale um, in a very short period of time. Um, the big thing is that it's really just Scrum. It's not an overly complicated thing. Um, and we are taking Scrum and, and just adding a couple of things onto it, like the executive action team, like the executive meta Scrum. And we're using those same frameworks um, to be able to scale up the whole organization. We're focused on improving the overall process, not just individuals, and figuring out how can we get twice the work in half the time. So with that, I'm a little bit over my time slot, so um, I guess we'll open it for questions. Well, I have a couple, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, first, you don't look old enough to have a son in college. Thank so. you. <laughs> I have good genes. <laughs> yes, there you go. Keep at it. Um, the next is how, when companies hire you, do you have any problems with, they want to get there, they want to do things, but no, we don't really want to do what you're telling us to do. Oh, you're smiling. So maybe that's, that is the case because, <laughs> uh, because part of what I struggle with, and I think that Colleen struggles with is that. I just want them to do good scrum for goodness sakes, you know, not to mention what I love to be able to try all these other things. I just want them to do things better now. And I just can't get, get them to do that or have management's backing, but go ahead. Um, so I am a consultant that will say, Hey, Hey, I'll meet you where you are. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out where we can start, where we can start to see some big impacts. Um, I was in an organization and they were doing an ERP implementation. So it was an SAP implementation. So enterprise resource planning, mm -hmm. yep. big train wreck, like almost every other <laughs> ERP <laughs> implementation I've ever seen. And the biggest impediment that was coming out of the teams was we're all on different floors. Like literally the configuration people were up here and the data people were down here. And they said, if we could just get a place to come together and meet. We're all in mm -hmm. the same building. Mm -hmm. And so we let them go about addressing this impediment their way. And um, they, they didn't have daily scrums as a leadership team. And one day the business leader who was responsible for the overall implementation. So thankfully they, they did have business buy-in. They were like, can we just get everyone in a room <laughs> and get this done? Mm -hmm. And I was like, thank you. So um, <clears throat> we've got to figure out how do we meet them where they are? How do we find a problem that is kind of a no brainer that they're able to solve and to put it in their face and let them choose to drink from, drink from the water? Um, there are lots of different tactics that we can use as we do that. But the biggest thing at, is what Jessica was talking about, putting it in their terms, mm -hmm. creating it in a way that they will understand because they've got MBAs, they're important people, right? <laughs> I have an MBA too, just so you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so how do we put these, these impediments and these issues into some sort of way that they can actually understand? All right. Yeah. And that's, and that can be quite the challenge. I mean, I kind of giggled when you said, have, do you have a uh, site into the, pro to the company backlog? And I'm like, I can see every backlog because we've got about a bazillion of them because they're all projects. Everybody's got all their projects and all of them are of course the most important. And that doesn't even include the stuff that, that upper management, the C-level actually wants us to complete. So, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I don't want to belabor what goes on at, at our company or at my company, uh, I'm sure Rob's tired of hearing about it anyway, but you know, it's, it's, yeah, I, I guess to, to a large extent, we keep trying to do what you've just said. And we try also to let them fail on their own and try to figure it out on their own. And it's just not happening fast enough <laughs> for me. Um, you know, cause I look at it and I say, this makes sense. Why can't you guys likewise see what we're trying to get at? And 
anyway, that's my two cents. Yeah. So I would, I would just say, try to figure out how, how you can speak their language and see some of, get them to see some of the results that they could have mm -hmm. if they were to change. Right. And that's, that's, that's also something we've been struggling with because if we can get a, even just one team, well, number one, I'd love to have even one team be a static team. We don't even have that. Um, but then just one project team that actually produces reasonably well so that we can show them the savings and show them what can be done. And yeah, we're even having troubles getting that far. So, but we will continue. Anyone else have a question? Yeah. If anybody um, doesn't want to actually talk on um, the video screen, you can always use a chat feature and I can read the question for you. So that's uh, an option. Hey Kim, this is uh, Kevin. I have a question. Um, what can you give some examples of some of the activities that the Scrum of Scrums master does? <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so they're generally working on re resolving some of the larger impediments that might be happening within the organization. Um, so recently, I was at a place, and they only had three hundred and fifty teams. I'm, but in this particular group we were working on, I think it was about uh, 40, 40 teams. Um, <clears throat> and one of the scrum, scrum masters was trying to figure out why one of the teams was going significantly slower. Or they haven't, hadn't increased in some of their velocity. And they helped the scrum master actually get into some of the team dynamic issues that were happening. And they were able to help them take a person off of that team that was kind of a virus and, and find a better match for that specific person. Um, and it ended up being a win-win. So the um, big thing is removing the impediments that the Scrum Masters themselves either A, can't do because they don't have the power or B, they don't have the time to do. Um, also coaching some of the Scrum Masters as well. Um, so helping them figure out how can they get better at their craft of being a Scrum Master. That could be holding guilds or COPs or whatever it is that you want to specifically call them. Um, and then also running those impediments up to the organization um, so that you can see those if they need to go to leaders, constantly following up with leaders, um, making sure that the water cooler conversations are also making it up to the leadership team as well. Um, I have seen a number of organizations who have had full-time Scrum of Scrums Masters and um, they, they've had some very inter interesting coaching conversations. It's been a, a very big growth uh, role for them to take, especially um, since most of the organizations that I've worked with are large, highly regulated um, companies. Does that awesome. help? It does, yeah, thank you very much. I would say they might also do some um, reporting as well. So we would never tell you to compare teams to each other's like from a velocity perspective, but we might say, you know, what are, what's going on with the happiness of the organization? What are we doing to address those particular things? Um, how can we get better um, from a velocity trend perspective? How are the teams going? Is there somewhere that we need to specifically focus? Oh, we have a compliance requirement that says that we have these 250 items that we have to do in order to move something into production. What can we do to change that larger policy or procedure to help us be able to meet our customer demands faster? Rob, you were going to say something. Yeah, I just want to make sure people know the chat feature or if they have any questions to keep going. We've got a few minutes. Anyone else? No. Connie, did, you said you had a couple of questions. I did, I'm all set. I continue down with, with some of the thoughts that I had, so. Okay. All right. Um, Kim, can you see the chat um, on the side? Uh, oh. How do we measure the EAT or the executive um, Metascrum? Um, <clears throat> how do we measure if the EAT or the Metascrum are bringing about the change? Um, so a, a, a couple of things, the executive action team, we're gonna basically hold them to the same accountability that we would the Scrum of Scrums Master. So are the teams happier? Are they delivering more? Um, maybe some of them would be how quickly are we turning around impediments? Um, and so this is definitely going to depend on where you are through the cycle. It could be that as you start this transition, people are afraid to bring up impediments. So it could be how many impediments are you actually getting and then how many are you resolving? But then 
once you start to empower people in teams, hopefully the, those numbers go down and you're only dealing with the really big things like how do I change job titles or how do I stop incentivizing specialists and incentivize people to work together as teams. Um, for the executive meta scrum, so the people who are focused on the, the product stuff, um, <laughs> the measuring value is always an interesting thing, but um, overall it's how much money is the company making how many new products are they trying out and how often are they failing? And um, that's an interesting thing because for whatever reason, companies are afraid to shut products down. And so they're afraid to tell people that, hey, we need to shut something down. And so I always refer people to the Google graveyard. It's okay for Google to shut products down. So it's okay for you to shut products down. If you're 90 days into a product and you still can't get a customer to talk to you about this problem that you're trying to solve, then maybe you need to pivot. Um, so I definitely focus on some of the lean startup, um, measure what matters, a, a lot of those types of concepts to figure out, are we working on the right thing? But also, are we allowing people to fail so that they're trying and coming up with wild and crazy ideas that we can actually go and implement? Okay, so that was the EAT and the executive meta scrum. Um, how do you combine Scrum teams with Kanban teams? So in Scrum at Scale, we don't really care if you use Scrum or if you use Kanban. Um, I mean, Jeff will tell you that he definitely wants you to use Scrum, but you can definitely still use Kanban um, <clears throat> when doing Scrum at Scale. You're still going to have impediments that you're going to want to get escalated. You're still going to want to have the executive meta Scrum who's prioritizing the overall backlog. You're still going to want to have product owners who are working on a large product together to work together as a team and to focus on what are those dependencies and how do they get through those things. Um, so there really isn't anything different that we do with Kanban teams. Um, I was at a large manufacturing organization recently and they like actually started to just tell their Kanban teams to do Scrum because they said, well, you still need to do some kind of planning and you still need to do some kind of retrospective so that you can come up with a process improvement. Um, so just on some regular cadence, making sure that you're going back and reflecting and saying, what's causing us to be or to, to slow down? What could we do to improve? There's another one there. How do orgs start with scaling Scrum, bottom up or top down? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll tell you in most of the organizations that I've been to, there, there's been a little bit of both. Um, in one organization that I was at, um, they decided in like 2010, 2011, hey, we don't have anyone who knows any of our products because we've outsourced everything to, you know, offshore. And so during that time, they brought in a bunch of people, um, including myself, who had technical experience. And we came in and we were like, oh my goodness, I cannot believe that you work this way. And so there were teams that were starting to do Scrum without really any support from the leadership team. In fact, the, the first implementation of Scrum that I did at that organization no one knew that they were doing Scrum other than me um, because we, we couldn't let the PMO know about that. Um, as those teams and all of those pockets started to go together, um, leaders started to take note. And so then they were like, hey, I want that kind of progress. And so as you got champions at the top, then we kind of got to the, the you know, top down, the bottom up, and then you get into that kind of frozen middle that we often talk about with middle managers. I prefer to go in and have leaders who are completely on board and that show not only am I willing to write a check to get everyone trained and to bring in coaches, but that I'm willing to show you that I'm going to work on my leadership ability as well and that I'm going to, you know, be a servant leader. Um, so typically top up or top down is, is a great place to come in and to have leaders who are behind you. Otherwise, you get into this point where those, those teams that are bottom up, they get to this kind of glass ceiling and they're like, hey, I see that there's a better way of working and there's no, no way for me to actually get better because my leaders aren't, aren't listening. And so then they actually start to get worse because they're like, what's the point? And then you might start to lose people um, as they go and find other organizations where they can be more agile. So I definitely top down is best. 
but you have to have people from the bottom who are willing to share and have the courage to share those impediments with leaders as well. Cool. Is it Shayla? Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Anything else? You know, this is nice. It's a, um, we've had very, very large meetups, but this is a nice manageable group size. So you guys should actually have a chance to talk if you want to um, and ask questions. Well, as you might be thinking of a, a question, um, feel free to meet up or to add me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm, I think, the only Kim Antello. Um, the rest of my husband's family are all in Spain or Brazil, um, okay. and I don't speak Spanish or Portuguese. So it would be very clear that it would be me. I have a question. Um, I was trying to make sure everyone else get a chance. Um, uh, the question is I have when it comes to trying to help the organization, uh, kind of say, hey, you know, what is your biggest problem? Let's focus only on that problem. And you, that there's a culture there or that reminiscent of working with um, statements of work. Because unfortunately, if there's no roadmap, there's no statement of work, then we're getting back into a traditional waterfall. So yeah. how do you uh, can make that clear demarcation between, you know, leadership say, hey, we can do Scrum, but we don't need to have all this paper up, up front or, or overhead just to discuss the problem when, hey, let's just get a problem on the whiteboard <laughs> and focus on that problem. So yeah. how, how do you kind of broach that and, and get that implemented? Um, one of the things that we will typically get into is how do we fund stable teams and not necessarily focused on fixed deliverable contracts. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully you have in-house support and not everything is outsourced um, and they have the ability to work on whatever it is that the executive meta scrum team is saying is most important. Um, if you have outsourced teams, you still have the ability to have a contract to do that, to say, we're going to give you work, <laughs> whatever that happens to be. Um, and it, it becomes more of a time and materials instead of a fixed deliverable thing. Um, and when people understand how much time they spend on change requests and how much time they spend on those statements of work, being able to articulate that to leaders um, becomes very clear and apparent. Um, <laughs> we were in a meeting once, someone was trying to get a PO approved and it was like, do you know that we just spent $10,000 to approve a you know, $2,000 PO? Like really, why, why are we doing this? Um, <clears throat> so Jessica, going back to your original comment of being able to say, hey, here's the problem and do you understand the impact? Or I love it when it's like, oh, well, we're gonna um, bid it out for this amount of work or this, this amount of time. And then we're gonna bid it out again. And now we have to train all of those new people on, on that thing that they're going to maintain. And when you know that you're getting into those kinds of things, you're not gonna focus on delivering high quality, right? So if you have to um, support the stuff that you're creating, we know that you're definitely going to do a better job um, of, of doing that. So. There are all sorts of things that we could get into in that specific topic. Any other questions from you guys in there? If there's not, we've been on for about an hour, which I think we uh, agreed was gonna be our time. Um, if you have any questions, of course, you can email either one of us and I can get the answers to you. Um, I'd say thank you for joining us and we're going to have more meetups coming up down the road. And uh, Kim and I are going to run a Scrum at Scale workshop in August. So, um, you know, if you want to look for information, michiganagiletraining.com. Um, I want to say thank all of you guys for joining us. It's been great. And uh, Kim, thanks for taking the time. I know you're in your bum knee. Bum knee, yeah. Yeah. It's tough living in Colorado. Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, as soon as you're back to it. Thanks, guys. Thank everybody for joining. Yep. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks, thanks, both thanks, Rob. Of you. thanks, Kim. Thanks, Rob. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll push the, uh, the video up so you guys can watch it. Okay. Great. Thanks, Rob. Yep. Thank you.